Um, Minister, I, I'm hoping that you'll help me to understand what the current strategy is. At the beginning of this, we were told that the strategy was to flatten the curve, that the virus would spread as it, viruses do, but that we needed to flatten the curve to ensure that our health system wasn't overrun and we didn't have scenes like we had in, in, in Italy and Spain. At that time when the restrictions were introduced, numbers were rising from 170 in hospitals to 440, from 50 in ICU to 80. Four months ago, on the 29th of April, there were 1,185 cases in hospital in Ireland, of which 120 so we know what were in uh, critical care units. Three times today you told us that we were, you were looking at a complete lockdown and that we were at tipping point. We've been hearing about a lot of tipping points, though. We've heard about tipping points now since June. We were also told today by the HSE that there were 22 patients admitted to hospital with ICU and six sorry, 22 admitted to hospital with COVID-19 and six in ICU. Now, I accept that, that for those 22 patients and their family, and in particular, the six in ICU and their families, that it's a, an incredibly worrying and stressful time. But what I don't understand, Minister, is how you can possibly talk about a national lockdown, given those figures, and given that our health system coped with 1,000 185 four months ago. So I want to know what is the strategy here? What are we hoping to achieve, if not that our health system is not overrun? Because Dr. Glenn earlier this week, I note, accepted that we cannot eliminate the virus. And that seems to be the general. I accept that there are those who are calling for it to be eliminated, but he said that he doesn't think we can eliminate it here. There's a growing acceptance that you can't eliminate it. And if you do, what do you do then? You open up and you go through the same cycle. You're talking about lockdowns. And you said a couple of times that they work. Argentina has been in a lockdown for six months. Figures are spiralling. Earlier this week, we had the WHO on RT News saying that lockdown, uh, lockdowns don't work. It was a, a Hans Kluge, who was the European director of the WHO. So... Where are we going? What is the strategy? Um, thank you, Chair. So, first of all, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I have mentioned a tipping point several times, um, but it's, it's not me making that up. I, I'm saying it because that is Neffet's position. And I think it's natural, Chair, that we all become fatigued with this. No, people, not... people have been through an awful lot. How can you... And, and the reason, Chair, that, that I am emphasising it and re-emphasising it um, is because we need to be on our, to, to, to be on our guard. Um, in terms of your, your question on do lockdowns work, well, we know they work because we did one here and it worked. Uh, they did them across Europe and they worked. If the purpose is to flatten the curve, we locked the country down, the, the curve was flattened. We and no that, that has been the experience of, of we have no most idea, of the countries we, we, we've looked at. We have no idea how many people are unable to bear. You talked about causing unnecessary anxiety by talk, the use of the word trampoline, and I very much accept your explanation. But talking about another lockdown in circumstances where we have, and again, I repeat, six people in ICU, and I regret each and every one of them desperately. I lost a very close relative of my own earlier this year, and I know uh, no, no matter what age somebody is at, you know, you don't want to lose somebody close to you. Of course you don't. But we're talking about national priorities. We have six people in ICU, 22 in hospital with COVID-19. At the height of this, we had one, over 1,100 people in hospital and 120 in ICUs. 
and you're talking about a lockdown again. Have you any idea of the effect that that's having? Forget about the economy for a moment, but we can't forget about it for too long because something has to fund our, our health care system. They don't fund themselves in any country in the world. Have you any idea the effect that that's having on mental health, on people's psyche, on people's spirit, on what's happening in the country now? How can you possibly talk about a lockdown, given that the figures, it flies in the face of reason? And we all have eyes, we all have a capacity to reason. Uh, you know, we're all live in a post-enlightenment world. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, of, of course, uh, I, I do uh, understand the implications, which is why I keep saying it. It's why we brought in the measures last week, is because we must suppress the virus in our community. A huge national priority has been getting the schools open for many of the reasons you say, and that's now happening that, 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 is it, because, the, because the, the transmission has been reduced. But Chair, I, I, I think your question is fair in that you're saying, look, the number of cases is going up, and we know it's going up very quickly. So, for example, the, the key measure that the public health experts use is the number of cases over the last two weeks per 100. Sorry, the number of detected cases, we've no idea really how many, what's happening outside of detection levels. Is that a, a, a fair thing? We, we do. There was a study done estimating that the total number is about uh, 40 to 50,000 versus the 27, 28,000 we, we've there detected. Are, there are other studies that, have, that are being prepared that... May or may, anyway. Okay. Look, the, the, one, the ones that, that, I, that the experts talk to me about are, are, are that one, that we have, we have detected probably a bit over a half of the total cases. But, Chair, um, this figure that they use, we, we were at three per 100,000 a while ago. Two weeks ago, we were at 18 per 100,000, and today we're at 30 per 100,000. So let, let's be very clear. Uh, this virus is rising again quickly in our community. Now, I think you very fairly ask, well, how is that linked to, to hospitalizations? Because the cases are high, but the hospitalizations, thank God, are low. Go back and look at the profile of what happened the first time. And what you'll find is that at this point uh, in, the, in the pattern, as, as the cases were in and around where they are now and rising rapidly, hospitalizations were also very low. So the unambiguous message and advice from public health chair is that death will follow high numbers of cases. So that what we don't want to do in, in is wait happened for, for the hospital system to be overrun. We don't want to wait for fatalities to go up and up and up before we act. We have to act first, and that, so that's what we're doing. But Minister, that line that deaths will follow increase in detected cases it hasn't happened across North America. It hasn't happened, thankfully to date at least, across Europe. Uh, Chair, the, the situation in North America, with the greatest of respect, is not, not one we need to be looking at to, 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 lear, to learn lessons I'm from. I'm not saying Chair, example, Chair, I'm Chair, saying that Donald Trump is doing a good job, and please don't mischaracterise me. I'm not. And, I, and I'm not. I'm, I'm not what I'm saying that. is that the increase in detected cases has not been accompanied, and it's, it's a trend that's going on for some time in North America and the continent. It hasn't been accompanied by an increase in hospitalisations and deaths. Thankfully, that's all I'm saying. I appreciate that. And just go back and look at the profile that happened here in, in, in March and April. And if we were back in March and April, we could well be having exactly this conversation. You could be saying, yes, cases are going up, uh, but the hospitalizations haven't happened at a big level. Therefore, do we need a lockdown to flatten the curve? And of course, as, as we all know, we've had nearly uh, 1,800 deaths. Uh, and the answer is yes, what, what, what we did was necessary. Um, so there are no easy answers to this, Chair. And what we're having to do is move early to stop the, to, to stop the fatalities and stop the critical care admissions and stop the hospitalizations. And I would just emphasize again, Chair, the, the success of Kildare, Leash and Offaly is that the communities there have shown that uh, relatively uh, uh, reduced measures, certainly compared to a lockdown, not only do they work, but they, they work very quickly. And, and simply that is, that is what we're doing. And, and Chair, I'm more than happy to stay for as long as you want and answer any questions. But if, if you'd allow me to just make the, the following ask uh, and, and say the following thing as well. Um, speed matters. So how fast we moved in the three counties mattered. How fast we're moving in terms of 
um, the national measures uh, matters a great deal, and critically, how quickly individuals respond matters. So there's very rightly in the committee been a lot of focus on the turnaround time for testing. Absolutely right. And we'll continue to bring that down and down and down. Um, but you know, the, the other part of that is the individual, individual responsibility we all have to take. So, so my ask is for people, if you feel symptomatic, um, to not do what we all do in the normal world, which is to wait a few days and see if we'll be okay, uh, is to go immediately to the GP. So, Chair, if we all act, if we all uh, move early and put up our hand and say to a GP, yeah, I've got one of the symptoms, can I, can I get a test? Uh, if we follow the public health guidelines around social distancing and face coverings and the, and, and the other things, um, we will move through this without the harsh, h harsher measures, and, and, and that, is ex that is exactly what it is we're trying to do. Uh, for example, in, in, we've obviously got to open the schools, but in, but in my brief, we have to get the healthcare system back up to capacity, and higher capacity than it had before because of the enormous number of men, women and children and, and uh, waiting for healthcare. And I know that you're going to provide the committee with the figures on what, how that capacity has increased in the coming days. And I thank you. Minister, I just join with you in asking people to behave responsibly, to take personal responsibility for their actions, to uh, adhere to the measures that have been outlined. But uh, speaking personally, I, I really would caution about talk of another lockdown because you, there is a risk of unleashing a whirlwind. That's my personal view. I, I really am not convinced that you will bring the country with you on that. Yeah, it, thank you, Chair. Uh, and, and that's not and, a committee view, that's a personal view. Yeah, and, and I accept that, and, and I, I fully accept your view. It, but, it, Chair, we're, we're not... We're, not we're, we're in a world where there are no easy answers. We are dealing with a global pandemic and a highly effective, vicious virus that we know kills people. Uh, and there is emerging evidence as to some of the longer-term health impacts for we people have the figures. That's who, one who don't die. So we have the figures on the number of... We're consistently told that young people suffer long-term effects, and I've no doubt that that's true. Do we have the figures on how many young people have long-term uh, debilitating effects from COVID? Or even people, forget about young people, but how many people who have overcome it, who have gone back to, um, uh, got to the stage that can go back to their day-to-day -day existence, whether that's as students, as workers, or, or, or as retirees, but who suffer long-term debilitating effects. Do we know what percentage that is in Ireland? Well, well, Chair, by definition we don't, because we, we haven't had the virus here long enough to, no, but we know that to be able to, we should to, be able have to answer those questions. Now. But what we can say is there are very sobering uh, case studies which medical experts are looking at around long-term issues, including respiratory issues uh, and, and, and others. But, Chair, the reality is we don't know what the long-term effect is. So we don't know yet. The, the, the doctors, the scientists, they don't know if there are uh, subtler, longer-term health complications. A lot of people who get this virus, they don't know that yet. Um, and we won't know that, obviously, by definition for a while. But they do point to other diseases where uh, there are long-term uh, impacts. And so at the moment, uh, and I, I hope you would agree with this, and I, 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 take, your, I take your points on, they're very reasonable, but I hope you agree with this, that given that this is a novel virus, um, unlike anything you or I have ever seen, uh, and given the loss of life that it has caused already, and given the very serious warnings we have from, from doctors and scientists saying there may well be longer term issues with this, I hope you would agree that we've got to do everything we can to suppress the virus. And right now, you, you asked at the start, what's the strategy? Right now, Chair, the strategy is to use the targeted measures as we are and to work as a nation in solidarity to follow basic but very effective infection control measures to suppress this virus and get on with opening our society, opening our public services, um, uh, opening our economy and protecting jobs. Thank you, Minister. I, I just want to ask a question of more uh, local interest to me. I don't expect a reply 
now, but maybe you could provide one in writing. It was um, the HSE told us earlier today that the department had engaged the DAA to carry out the the, um, the, the follow-up calls for, for people coming into the country. I suppose I'd like to know what tendering process was done around that, or how Dublin Airport was selected over, for example, Shannon Airport, which is now going through a, a redundancy, a round of redundancies. You know, because there's a lot of capacity there too, and sometimes it appears that there's um, only one airport in the country when it comes to uh, Irish officialdom. If you want to reply now, you're welcome to. But otherwise, I'd ask you to reply in writing. It's it's up to yourself, Minister. Thank you, Chair. No, no problem at all, and I'll, I'll get you more detail in writing, but the short answer is actually the Department of Health has procured the contract. Yeah, with the Dublin Airport Authority, but how? No, no with, a, with a private firm to, to do the work. So, so the DAA uh, was originally looking at it, but it was my department has, has uh, taken that over and procured the contract. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Look, there are a couple of other issues I'd like to raise, but I've taken enough of your time. I thank you very much. Before concluding, I, I wish to thank you for coming in, Minister, making yourself available. I appreciate it. it's a busy time, and it's a very busy time for your officials. I particularly